Southern Fried True Crime covers cases that are not suitable for young listeners, and there may also be some explicit language used. Listener discretion is advised. Last week, I told you about the abduction and murder of 17-year-old Sherry Faye Smith. She was snatched out of her own driveway in broad daylight, and her abductor called her family numerous times before finally telling them where her body was five days later. Exactly two weeks to the hour after Sherry's abduction, nine-year-old Deborah Mae Helmick was kidnapped from her front yard. Deborah Mae's family would have to wait eight days to learn her fate. But her killer, Larry Jean Bell, kept calling Dawn Smith, Sherry Faye Smith's sister. He gave her the directions to Deborah May's body. Larry Jean Bell kept the South Carolina Midlands frozen in fear for 28 days. But he did make a crucial mistake that would be his downfall. And his ridiculous displays in court failed to impress two juries about his supposed mental incompetence. But this isn't just the story of a monster kidnapping girls and tormenting families. This is a story of families who refuse to be broken, whose faith and strength brought them through unspeakable tragedy. Welcome to Episode 49, The Murder of Deborah May Helmick and the Reckoning of Serial Killer Larry Jean Bell. It was another unusually hot day in the South Carolina Midlands. Friday, June 14th, is summer, but it's early summer. And early June in the year of 1985 was particularly hot, with thermometers peaking over 100 degrees. At 4.07 p.m., just 25 miles from Sherry Faye Smith's home, nine-year-old Deborah May Helmick was playing in the front yard of her mobile home with her three-year-old brother Woody and six-year-old sister Becky. They were waiting for their mom, who was about to get a ride to work at Ray Lever's Barbecue with her friend Vicky. The kids were going to ride with them and then stay at Vicky's until their dad got home from work. Vicky lived at the Shiloh Mobile Home Park, too. There were only 13 trailers and one entrance. But on that day, Sherwood Helmick pulled up to the trailer right as his wife Deborah was leaving. Deborah May's mother's name is also Deborah. So instead of going with her mom, Deborah May and her little brother decided to stay. Her six-year-old sister Becky still wanted to ride with her mom, so she left with Deborah and Vicky. Mr. Helmick walked into the trailer as his other two kids were goofing around in the yard. His friend, Johnny Flake, had given him a ride and came inside to get cooled off with him. He sat down on the couch as Mr. Helmick went to go change out of his work clothes. Mr. Helmick then heard one of the kids yelling, but thought they were just playing until his friend Johnny sounded concerned too. He ran out his front door and saw his son Woody, under a bush crying, but he couldn't understand him. As he came out, his neighbor, Ricky Morgan, came running up too. He was yelling, did you see that man take your daughter? Sherwood Helmick ran all the way around the trailer and out into the road, but didn't see Deborah May. So he and his friend Johnny jumped in Johnny's car and drove quickly to the nearest intersection. He jumped out and started stopping cars, asking if they had seen his daughter or the car his neighbor had described. He saw a sheriff's deputy drive by and flagged him down, screaming, Someone has taken my daughter. The officer radioed for help, and the response was instant. Everyone was well aware of the Sherry Faye Smith case, and law enforcement and the community jumped into action. Though their ages were pretty far apart, both were pretty blonde girls, and this wouldn't turn out to be a coincidence. The neighbor, Ricky Morgan, told the police what he saw. He lived four trailers down from the Helmix, and he was standing at his kitchen sink mixing up frozen orange juice. He didn't have air conditioning, so his window was open. He looked out the window and saw a white man get out of a car parked right in front of the Helmix trailer. He had left the car running and his door open and he grabbed Deborah May around the waist and drug her back to his car. He said Deborah May was kicking and screaming, with her little feet kicking on top of the roof, until her abductor threw her inside across the seat. 
He said then she stopped kicking. It's possible she hit her head. He described her kidnapper as a white man, 30 to 35 years old, about five foot nine with a beer belly. He said he had brown receding hair and a closely trimmed beard. Ricky even remembered what he was wearing, white short pants and a sleeveless shirt. He described the car as a silver or gray, 82 or 83 Grand Prix Monte Carlo with red racing stripes. He even remembered the first letter on the license plate was D. That model car looks very similar to the Oldsmobile Cutlass described in Sherry Fay's abduction. I am not at all a car person, and so I googled the pictures, and I probably would have confused the two. The police also questioned poor little three-year-old Woody. He was very scared and shaken up, and said that the bad man told him that he was coming back to get him. Naturally, Deborah Helmick, Deborah May's mother, blamed herself. If only Deborah May and Woody had gone with her as usual, this wouldn't have happened. But it was no one's fault. No one but the monster stalking little blonde girls. The Helmecks had only lived in the trailer park for about two weeks. They had moved from Canton, Ohio in 1981 and lived with Sherwood Helmecks' mother until they got their own place. They were a hard-working couple who adored their children, and Mr. Helmick would have preferred that Deborah stay home with the kids, but she wanted to work because the young family needed the money. Deborah May's abduction was gut-wrenching to the family, but also to the community that was still grieving Sherry Faye Smith and also still on high alert for her murderer, who hadn't been caught. The neighbor, Ricky Morgan, was able to provide a better detailed description for a composite sketch. But as so often happens with police sketches in terrified communities, it mainly led to unfounded tips. And for eight days, Richland and Lexington County residents held their breath, praying Deborah May would be found safe, that the cases were not connected. But on the eighth day, the telephone rang at the Smith home. The Smiths, who had buried their daughter only two weeks before, were still going to be tormented. Dawn Smith answered the phone and the caller said, I have a collect call from Sherry Faye Smith, and she agreed to take the call immediately. Dawn Smith was no shrinking violet. She had been through so much, but she was also very aware of what the Helmicks were going through. She was ready to fight. He said, you know this isn't a hoax, correct? Did you find Sherry Faye's ring? He was referring to her school ring, which had never been found. He had referenced it in previous calls. Dawn said no, she hadn't found the ring. Then he said, okay, I don't know where it is, okay? You know, God wants you to join Sherry Faye. It's just a matter of time. This month, next month, this year, next year. You can't be protected all the time. And you know, have you heard about Deborah May Hamrick? He had mispronounced the name, and Dawn said that she didn't know. So he said, the 10-year-old, and then spelled Helmick. And Dawn answered, Richland County? And then he said, yeah, okay, listen carefully. Go one north, well, to Bill's Grill. Go three and a half miles through Gilbert and then turn right. Last start road before you come to the stop sign at Two Notch Road. Go through the no trespassing signs, 50 yards, and to the left. Go 10 yards. Deborah May is waiting. God forgive us all. Dawn said, hey, listen. And he said, what? She said, just out of curiosity, how old are you? He said, Dawn E., your time is near. God forgive us and protect us all. Good night for now, Dawn E. Smith. She tried to keep him on the phone, asking for the pictures he had claimed to have taken of her sister. He claimed the FBI must have intercepted them, and she said, no, sir, because when they have something, we get it too, you know. Are you going to send them? I think you're jerking me around because you said they were coming and they're not here. Dawn E. Smith, I must go, he said. Dawn was trying her damnedest, but he wasn't having it. Mercifully, no photographs of Sherry's rape and murder were ever found. But Dawn was trying everything she could to talk to him. She knew he was fixated on her, and she was not afraid to exploit that. Good night, Dawn. I'll talk to you later, he said, and hung up. And just like in Sherry's case, the police traced the call to a payphone, and he had already disappeared. This one was in Sumter, South Carolina, about 50 miles from the Smith home. 
Lexington County Law Enforcement, as well as SLED, rushed to the location indicated. Side note, got your emails, guys. I will refer to the SLED as SLED from now on. I just didn't want to cause confusion for anyone not from the region. But I'll now make sure everyone has the heads up. South Carolina Law Enforcement Division is abbreviated to SLED and is called SLED regionally. Just as he had done in the Sherry Faye Smith abduction, the murderer gave correct directions for law enforcement to find Deborah May Helmick. Her small body was found in brush and leaves, and again, the heat had accelerated decomposition. There were pieces of blonde hair found all around the body. Attached to one clump was a pink barrette. Deborah May's mother identified it as the one she put in her daughter's hair after she had washed and dried it that June afternoon. But the police could not take this as a positive identification. There were no dental records available for Deborah May, but her footprints, recorded on her birth certificate, were a match. Deborah May had also been fingerprinted at Hawking Tech College when her family lived in Ohio, and those prints finally came in as well. The coroner was able to lift prints from her hands, and they were also a match. But Deborah May's traumatized parents had not only identified her barrette, but also her clothing. She had worn white, pinstriped shorts and a lavender t-shirt. Her mother also identified her cotton underwear. But she did not recognize the silky women's panties that had been placed over Deborah May's underwear. Her killer had dressed her in sexy women's lingerie over her own pitiful little girl cotton panties. Lieutenant Rita Schuler mentions the heartbreak she felt in photographing these items. She was the forensic photographer for SLED who wrote the book, Murder in the Midlands, 28 Days of Terror. She also photographed the crime scenes and the bodies of the girls as they were found. She lived and worked in the area. She was a part of the community that wept and prayed for these girls. And she would be part of the team who caught their killer. In Ms. Schuler's book, she recalls that law enforcement were camped out in the Helmick trailer, just as they had been at the Smith home, waiting for his calls. At one point, Mr. Helmick became so upset at local TV footage that he picked up his television set and threw it out the door. The Helmicks waited an excruciating eight days to find Deborah May, and as with Sherry Faye Smith, this wasn't over. He was still out there, and the news cycle wasn't stopping anytime soon. Deborah May's funeral had originally been scheduled for Tuesday, June 25th, but her mother asked for it to be moved to the next day. Her little sister Becky would turn seven that Tuesday, and her mom didn't want her to always associate her birthday with her big sister's funeral. Though the Smith family had not yet met the Helmicks, they did attend Deborah May's funeral, praying fervently for the grief-stricken family. No one could understand what the Helmicks were going through like the Smiths could. These families would stay inextricably linked. It had now been 27 days since Sherry Faye Smith had been abducted and this nightmare in the Midlands had begun. But the next day, law enforcement finally got a break. Remember when I told you about Sherry Faye's letter in the last episode, titled, Last Will and Testament? I told you about a method they used to lift impressions off the paper of what was written on the page before it in the notebook that had been ripped off first. Among several words that seemed like a grocery list were numbers. It was a phone number with an Alabama area code, and investigators had been trying different combinations, trying to connect a phone number with the murders in South Carolina. They finally got a hit. It was a Huntsville, Alabama number that had been called from a home and business in the Lexington and Saluda County areas. On one of the many calls made to the random numbers, a man named Joseph Shepard said yes, my parents live in Saluda County. Their names were Ellis and Sharon Shepard, and they lived just 15 miles from the Smiths. When the FBI called the Shepherds, they said, yes, our son Joey is stationed at an army base in Huntsville. And they were immediately cooperative. The couple explained that they traveled frequently and employed a house sitter named Larry Jean Bell. They were questioned extensively for most of Thursday, June 27th. They described their house sitter as a white man, five foot ten inches tall, with a flabby belly, reddish brown hair with a beard and mustache. He also had a ruddy complexion. 
Larry Jean Bell had been working for them since the early spring of that year. First, he worked with Ellis Shepard as an electrician, and he liked Bell and thought he would make a good house sitter. The Shepherds kept a legal pad by their telephone, and on that pad, they had written information and emergency numbers for Bell for when they were gone. One of these numbers was Joey's, and the impression of those digits was left on the letter that Sherry Faye Smith had been forced to write to her parents. Their first trip that they had used Bell as a house sitter was after Mother's Day that year on May 13th. They returned on June 3rd. If you recall from the last episode, Sherry Faye Smith was abducted on Friday, May 31st, while the Shepherds were still out of town. Larry Jean Bell had given instructions to the location of her body on June 5th. When the Shepherds returned, they noticed that Bell had trimmed his usually unruly beard pretty close to his face. When Mrs. Shepard remarked on this, he told her he was getting, quote, summarized. Then, according to the Shepherds, Larry Jean Bell turned the conversation to the abduction of Sherry Faye Smith and refused to change the subject. Remember, this would be June 3rd when they returned, and Bell asked them, do you think the family would want to find the body so they could make funeral arrangements? This was two days before he called and gave the Smith family directions to her body. Mr. Shepard said, well, since she was kidnapped, hopefully she's still alive. But Bell kept repeating that question. And then he did something that creeped Mrs. Shepard out. When she had first met Larry Jean Bell, he had called her Mrs. Shepard. But as he had gotten to know her, he started calling her Sharon by her first name. But on that day, June 3rd, he called her Sherry. No one called her that. And she found it unnerving. On June 5th, A neighbor stopped by and told them that Sherry Faye Smith had been found. Bell showed up at 2 p.m. to take them to the airport for their next trip. When they asked him if he had heard about Sherry Faye's body being found, he answered quickly, No, too bad! And then, all the way to the airport, he talked nonstop about the case. They said he repeatedly told them, I feel so bad for the family. Even though Sharon Shepard was irritated by Bell's odd obsession with the case, she was interested herself and asked him to save all the newspapers until they returned. On the previous trip, she had instructed him to throw them out. This time, he picked them up at the airport on Monday, June 24th. This was just two days after Deborah May Helmick's body had been found and two days before her funeral. Both Shepards noticed a dramatic change in his appearance. Larry Jean Bell had lost around 10 pounds. They said he looked unkempt, where before he had always been neat. Mrs. Shepard said she patted him on the shoulder and said, You look tired. Are you okay? And he answered, Well, no, I'm just not myself. When they got back to the house, Bell packed up all of his belongings. The Shepherds thought this was strange because he was going to work with Ellis in the morning and he would usually have spent the night. His parents lived on Shoal Island off Lake Murray, and it was easier for him to just stay. Also, he was due to take them to the airport again that Friday and would be house-sitting for a few more weeks. Why would he take his things? After he left, Mrs. Shepard said she was anxious to read the newspapers he had saved and went looking for them. To her horror, he had cut out and organized all of the articles about the kidnappings and murders. And the clippings weren't just from the Columbia area newspapers, but from all over the state. She told investigators that she got chills when she looked at the composite sketch and clips of the killer. She went to her husband and said, that sort of looks like Larry and his obsession with all of this and saving the articles. Oh my God, could he have had something to do with this horrible thing? Her husband answered, gracious, no, not Larry, but it was really just to ease her mind. He was also now worried and he realized he couldn't find his gun. He called Bell and asked him where it was, and he told him he had hidden it under his mattress. Mr. Shepard did find it there, but it was strange. When he was driving to work the next morning with Bell, he asked him. He said, that composite sketch looks a bit like you, Larry. What do you think? Bell answered, well, they did stop me twice in roadblocks they had set up, but they sent me on through. Mr. Shepard was still worried, but thought if he at least confronted Larry, he might feel better. And then SLED investigators played the tape from the call made to Don about Deborah May Helmick. On some of his first calls, Bell had purposely distorted his voice somehow. But in later calls, he didn't bother, and he didn't with this one. The Shepherds immediately recognized his voice. 
Sharon Shepard burst into tears, and Ellis said, My God, he threw her body out around Bill's grill. Larry told me numerous times that Bill's Grill in Gilbert was one of his favorite places to eat. They had him. Time was up for Larry Jean Bell. Larry Jean Bell was born in Ralph, Alabama on October 30, 1949. He had three sisters and a brother, and his family moved around a lot. They landed in Columbia, South Carolina in 1965, where Larry attended Eau Claire High School. But then they moved to Mississippi, and there he graduated from high school and trained as an electrician. In 1969, he came back to Columbia and married a 16-year-old girl. He was 20 at the time, and they had a son together. He did a stint in the Marines, and then he was discharged after he accidentally shot himself in the knee. He also worked for one month as a prison guard for the Department of Corrections in Columbia. His employment record is spotty like that. He rarely stayed anywhere more than a few months. In 1972, he moved his family to Rock Hill, South Carolina. Then in 1976, his wife left him, took their son, and moved out of state. What led to the divorce isn't really known. It could have been the usual reasons. But it could also be because in February of 1975, Larry Jean Bell was arrested for aggravated assault and battery. He had approached a young woman in a shopping center parking lot and said, Come go with me. Let's go to Charlotte and party. When she said no, he pulled a knife on her and pointed it at her stomach and started trying to drag her to his green Volkswagen. But she wasn't going without a fight. She kicked and screamed until he finally let her go and then sped off in his car. Another woman in the parking lot had seen what was happening and ran to a payphone and called the police. Larry Jean Bell was caught less than a mile from the shopping center and arrested. But this was his first offense, at least on record. So he was offered a plea deal, which he accepted, a five-year suspended sentence with a $1,000 fine. He was also put on a five-year probation. We always wonder in cases like this that if the first offense was charged more seriously, would it have mattered? But plea deals are extremely common in this country. It wasn't unusual, particularly for a first offense. But in October of the same year, he approached another woman, this time in Columbia, and told her, I am armed. He showed her a pistol and tried to force her into his car, but she got away. She was later able to identify him through mugshots, and in June of 1976, he pled guilty to assault and battery of a high and aggravated nature. He was again sentenced to five years, and his probation was revoked. But he only spent two years in prison before being released on parole. A prison psychiatric report stated he was a continuing danger to women, and the chance of him repeating his acts is very high. At one point, Larry Jean Bell even checked himself into a psychiatric hospital. Records show he was treated for a personality disorder of, quote, a psychosexual nature and he was hospitalized two other times for psychological issues. In October of 1979, he was convicted of making obscene phone calls to a 10-year-old girl. From February to July of 1979, he kept calling the girl. Police put a recording device on the phone, and he was eventually arrested, but was given a two-year suspended sentence and put on another five-year probation. And this is where the suspended sentences get even harder to swallow. He had a record, and he had served time for assaulting women, and now he was harassing a child by phone. And yet, no jail time. Though there are not records after this 1979 offense, it's safe to say Larry Jean Bell was still a predator. He was suspected in other unsolved kidnappings and homicides that I will get into later. But now, on June 27, 1985, he was finally done. Law enforcement took no chances. Roadblocks were in place by 2 a.m. on Shoal Island, a mile from his parents' driveway. At 7.30 a.m., Larry Jean Bell drove up to the roadblock. He put up no resistance. He said, this is about those two girls. Can I call my mama? He was initially taken to the Lexington County Sheriff's Office, but on advice from the FBI's Behavioral Science Unit, a mobile home behind the Sheriff's Office had been set up for his interrogation. 
The walls of the trailer were covered with photos of Sherry Faye Smith, Deborah May Helmick, maps of the areas, the composite sketch of Bell, and other photographs and evidence in the cases. Bell was noticeably distracted by all of this, as they had hoped. In particular, he kept staring at the photographs of his victims while they were alive, smiling, beautiful, innocent, and blonde. Investigators, his own lawyers, and soon everyone would come to know that Larry Jean Bell was obsessed with blonde girls and women. And his tone in this interview is one he would maintain throughout his trials. I'm innocent. I surely don't know that I could do that. Lieutenant James Perry with SLED took the reins on this interview. He answered, well, did some other part of you do this? Is there some other person in you that does this? He answered, I can say that this Larry Jean Bell didn't do this. He was setting up his own psychiatric defense. When he was played a tape of himself on the phone with Dawn, he said, that's not the Larry Jean Bell that I know. Perry started explaining the evidence they had against Bell, whom he called Jean. I found this a bit confusing until I saw that he referred to himself as Jean in an ad offering his electrical services. But the Shepherds knew him as Larry. It's likely he used both names, maybe in case people had heard of the crimes of one Larry Bell. But Jean Bell wouldn't be remembered. Perry told him about the biggest piece of evidence that had nailed him. The pad of paper from the Shepherds' home the one he forced Sherry Faye Smith to write that letter to her family entitled Last Will and Testament on. Only you had access to the shepherd's house when they were gone, he told him. Bell replied, I know for a fact, y'all, like you said, wouldn't have me here without evidence and stuff. I can't confess for somebody else, and I don't want this Larry Jean Bell to be executed for something that is in his mind. He shouldn't have done that to those poor girls. Bell would go back and forth in denying things, and then he would say that one of the tapes played does sound like Larry Jean Bell sitting here. And then he would go look at the evidence photos and proclaim, this Larry Jean Bell didn't do that. After hours of this nonsense, Lieutenant Perry and another investigator working with him were finished. And then Sheriff James Metz stepped into the trailer. When Bell saw him, he said, I'm so nervous and scared. I'm not a criminal. Metz said, why are you nervous? What's done is done. You can't do anything about that. Talk to me, Jean. He once again played one of the phone calls for Bell and said, you know it's you on these tapes. You know your voice, right? Bell said while laughing, well, I haven't listened to myself enough to know. Metz played another tape and Bell said, that didn't sound like me. I just don't believe I'm involved in it. The sheriff replied, you are. Jean, this is a terrible thing. Let it out. Hell, break down and cry if you want. Ask God to forgive you. Get yourself right and help me help others. God help us and protect us all. That's your own terminology, isn't it? You know for a fact that is you on the tapes. At this, Larry Jean Bell sat back and sighed. He said, there's no doubt about it. Ever what's in me doing this, or if I did these terrible things, it's just not right. God didn't put me here to take somebody's life. I know you, and you know what happens to me now. They're going to go for the death penalty. Then he asked the sheriff if he could talk to the Smith family, because if it turned out he was the murderer, he wanted God and the family to forgive him. Investigators considered his request, and thought maybe he would finally confess if they allowed him to talk to the Smiths. Dawn and Hilda Smith agreed to this interview. They arrived at 6.30 p.m., and were led to a room where Sheriff Metz, Prosecutor Donnie Myers, and other officers, and FBI profiler John Douglas were waiting with Larry Jean Bell. Bell started the conversation by saying, Thank y'all for coming. Sheriff Metz said that the evidence is here, but this person sitting here, I could not have done this ungodly thing. Right now, I don't know how to explain it. Mrs. Smith and Dawn immediately recognized his voice. Dawn spoke clearly and said, I recognize your voice. I know it's you. I talked to you on the phone. Do you recognize my voice? Bell said that he recognized her from the TV and paper. And then he said, It's just the bad side of me that caused all this horrible destruction in people's lives. Your sister and that little girl. It's just something in me. They went back and forth like this for quite a while. He always said her name Dawn in every sentence. But she was quite the sparring partner. She would not be intimidated. She would not back down. He said, Dawn, 
whatever caused this, I truly hope this won't destroy y'all's lives. This is going to destroy my family too. There's bad in me, but I can't say the devil put it there because I say my prayers every night and every morning. But he would say things like this and then deny he had ever met Sherry or that he recognized Dawn's voice. He went back and forth and back and forth in circles. Dawn told him repeatedly that she knew definitely it was him on the tapes. She said, we just want to know the truth, nothing else. Bell said, when I can come up with the truth, I'll tell y'all all of that. Then Mrs. Smith spoke up and said, even though I sit this close and look at you and know you're the man that called my house, I don't hate you. There is not enough room in my heart for more pain. And she truly meant it. The Smith's faith and capacity for forgiveness is astonishing. Their strength, and particularly Dawn's bravery, throughout Sherry's kidnapping, the investigation, and the trials is so inspiring. Not long after Mrs. Smith made this statement, they called it quits. They had heard enough, and it was clear that Larry Jean Bell intended to just keep playing with them. As they left, he thanked them again and said, God bless us all. As the interrogation of Larry Jean Bell and then his meeting with the Smith family happened, crime scene investigators had started at the Shepherd home, where he had been house-sitting when he murdered Sherry Faye Smith and Deborah May Helmick. Though they had certain items on the warrant, they focused in first on the guest room where Larry Jean Bell had stayed. The room looked immaculate fresh sheets, and recently vacuumed to the point where the grooves were still in the carpet. But the crime scene team still found evidence. Under the clean sheets was another very stained sheet that was used as a mattress pad. And Bell wasn't as careful in the bathroom either. They found several hairs and fibers, including pubic hairs around the toilet. In Bell's car, they found a license plate starting with D that was registered to his sister, Diane. It was the plate he was using when he grabbed Deborah May. Bell's parents gave police permission to search their home. They found a notebook and pen and several Mallard duck stamps, like the one on Sherry Fay's letter. They found a starter pistol that didn't fire bullets, but could certainly scare someone if you brandished it at them. And in his dresser drawer, underneath his clothes, were bags of women's silky bikini panties, just like the pair Deborah May was dressed in. Duct tape was found in Bell's work truck, and also at the Shepherd's and his parents' house. The trace evidence found earlier was all tested. There were fibers in his bed that were consistent with fibers found on Sherry Fay, and her blood type was found on the mattress pad sheet. There were semen and urine found that weren't her type, but Larry Jean Bell refused to give a sample even under court order. Solicitor Donnie Myers didn't push for Bell's blood sample because he thought that along with the rest of the evidence, Bell's refusal to cooperate just made the case stronger. Today, all of this trace evidence would be shaky without DNA. Hair and trace evidence testing techniques have been called into question in recent decades now that we have better, more sophisticated tests. But in 1985, most of this was great physical evidence, and there was certainly plenty of circumstantial evidence to go with it and Bell was also painting himself into corners. He agreed to speak with investigators from Charlotte, North Carolina. A woman named Sandy Cornett had vanished on November 18, 1984. Larry Jean Bell worked with her boyfriend and had been to a birthday party at her house shortly before. He had told Lieutenant Mike Temple, who was transporting him to the Richland County Courthouse for a hearing, that he wanted to talk to officers from North Carolina concerning a missing girl named Sandra. Temple said he mentioned two other young women from North Carolina, but didn't mention their names. But while they were setting up a formal interview with Charlotte officials, they started connecting Bell to unsolved cases in that area, which were probably the two women he alluded to. On July 31, 1975, Denise Porch went missing. She managed an apartment complex in Charlotte, and Larry Jean Bell lived just 300 yards from her. Another girl, named Beth Marie Hagen, just 17 years old, had been found strangled to death with an electrical cord on December 18, 1980. Like Smith and Helmick, her body was found in a wooded area, and Bell lived about a mile from there at the time. So officials sat down for a talk with Larry Jean, and he was really beginning to enjoy the attention. I think he liked having officers at his beck and call. I know he liked that the Smiths agreed to talk to him after he asked. 
It was all feeding into his ego. As soon as the interview started, he said, Y'all from Charlotte, aren't you? I've been expecting you. What took you so long? Investigator Larry Walker just said, Yes, it is our understanding you want to talk about Sandy Cornett. To which Bell said, I will dedicate 110% cooperation. Which was bullshit. What he did was dominate the 12-hour interview with his ramblings about God and visions. He never gave them anything tangible about Sandy Cornett or the other two women. He said strange things like, I am the most gifted man in the world because God saps things down to me and is using me to bring messages. He may have strung the North Carolina officials along about their cases, but he did make statements about Smith and Helmick. He insisted they both died with their eyes closed and their hands crossed in prayer. He even said he cleaned up after Sherry Faye's murder, throwing evidence into a green dumpster before going home and taking a long, cold shower. These statements were very damning and would later be used in court. But officials were getting tired of his shit. And they had more important legal issues to deal with. Smith and Helmick had been kidnapped in Lexington and Richland counties, but had probably been killed in Saluda County. To lay people, that probably doesn't seem important, but it is relevant to how Bell would be charged and where he would be tried. The kidnappings were charged in their respective counties, and Smith's murder was charged in Saluda and then combined with her case in Lexington. Helmick's murder was charged in Lexington County, and then her kidnapping case was merged there. Finally, on August 12, 1985, a Saluda County grand jury handed down formal indictments for the kidnapping and murder of Sherry Faye Smith, and Larry Jean Bell was served with a death notice, which means that Saluda County would be seeking the death penalty. On September 4, 1985, the same thing happened with the Lexington grand jury for the kidnapping and murder of Deborah May Helmick. Again, prosecutors would seek the death penalty. Rita Schuler notes in her book, Murder in the Midlands, that Bell became cockier as the legal proceedings continued. He frequently spoke out in court when he should have remained quiet. At a bond hearing, he said he wanted the Smith and Helmick families to put their friends on the juries before claiming that he was totally innocent and it would be proven without a doubt. Between these outbursts and all of his strange ramblings in earlier interviews, and along with his history in psychiatric hospitals, officials had to make sure he was competent to stand trial. Police and prosecutors knew he was full of shit, but they didn't want anything coming back on them during the appeals process. South Carolina state psychiatric examiners found him competent to assist his counsel and stand trial. This would be the first of many competency examinations in Larry Jean Bell's two trials. His defense attorney, Jack Swirling, a well-respected defense lawyer for the state, certainly did his due diligence, requesting competency hearings during the last hours of trials and sentencing. Whether or not he truly believed his client is debatable, but he did fight tooth and nail for the insanity defense. Solicitor Donnie Myers would try both cases, and he was known as one of the most aggressive death penalty prosecutors in the state. He had the support of the communities, but death penalty trials have their own unique processes, which take a long time. First, you've got to qualify a juror for the death penalty, which means many jurors are struck for cause right away if they admit they are against the death penalty. You have to draw from large jury pools, and the selection process is long and tedious. Jack Swirling also asked for a change of venue, which is not at all surprising, but Judge John Hamilton Smith denied his motion. So therefore, along with the required death penalty questions, potential jurors were questioned more intently about the pretrial publicity and if they could remain impartial. After two days, the judge surprised everyone with an announcement that he had changed his mind. The trial for the abduction and murder of Sherry Faye Smith would be moved to the low country town of Monk's Corner in Berkeley County, about 127 miles from Saluda, and the trial date was set for January 27, 1986. Berkeley County residents were much more likely to have not heard of Larry Jean Bell, and the trial should have been moved in the first place. But it did finally start on February 10th, delayed again because Bell's attorney had been ill. But it did finally start, and Larry Jean Bell made sure it went off with a bang. Just getting out of the patrol car the first day of court, he was yelling, I am Larry Jean Bell. I am not guilty. I am the walrus. 
Then during jury selection, Bell stood up and said, Why in the hell am I being held at the gates of hell for this crime I didn't commit? Explain this to me. These outbursts often delayed proceedings and were especially disruptive during jury selection. At times, he would cry and sob, once yelling, Your Honor, I can't take this anymore. Jean Bell is not responsible for this. This is not right. I want to see my doctor. His attorney asked for a recess because his client could not participate due to his mental health. Judge Smith started off sternly right away with Larry Jean. He agreed to a brief recess, but warned Bell that jury selection would go on with or without his presence in the courtroom, letting him know that he wouldn't stand for his outbursts, but he also wouldn't hold up court proceedings for them either. After that, Bell kept his trap shut the rest of the day, and a jury was finally selected. The prosecutor first put on Sherry's boyfriend to explain the timeline of the day, and then two eyewitnesses who had passed her on the road as she stood at the mailbox and also passed Larry Jean Bell in his car. They both picked him out in the courtroom as the man they saw. Mrs. Hilda Smith was next, and as throughout this entire ordeal, her grace and strength shone through with the eloquence with which she spoke. Solicitor Myers asked her about the phone calls, and she said, I had heard that voice over and over. Even when I tried to go to sleep at night, I couldn't cut that voice off, but it didn't have a face. When I heard Larry Jean Bell talk, then I had a face to go with a voice I had been hearing over and over again. Larry Jean Bell was the voice, and he had been caught. Dawn Smith followed her mother to the stand, and her composure was equally impressive. She spoke clearly and often pointedly looked Larry Jean Bell in the eye. Forensic pathologist Dr. Joel Sexton took the stand and did what he could, even though with the advanced decomposition of Sherry Fay's body, he could not say for certain whether she had been sexually assaulted or even how she died. Defense attorney Swirling grilled him under cross-examination, really hitting home that rape could not be proven, nor could they rule out that Sherry Fay had died of natural causes due to her condition of diabetes insipidus. Ellis and Sharon Shepard were next up explaining their relationship to Bell, his strange obsession with the case, and about the legal pad found in their home. They set up the next witness, SLED questioned document examiner Mickey Dawson, who explained the ESDA procedure which had produced the Alabama phone number they found. This had been the crucial clue that finally broke the case. They were able to match this number with people who knew Larry Jean Bell. Lieutenant Rita Schuler's photographs of the last will and testament letter from Sherry Fay were enlarged and shown to the jury. Sled trace evidence investigators were next up, and they went through all of the evidence. When Swirling cross-examined them, they were able to point out that by Bell refusing to give a blood sample, they couldn't positively identify him, but it also might have positively excluded him. The implication was clear. Larry Jean Bell couldn't take that chance. Again, this was pre-DNA, so it would have been a matter of blood typing, but Bell wouldn't even risk that. Charlotte investigator Larry Walker testified to what officials believed was a confession on Bell's part when he spoke to him about the North Carolina cases. But out of the presence of the jury, the judge ruled he could only testify to statements made about Sherry Fay, not about Deborah May Helmick or the suspected North Carolina cases. So he testified to what Bell had said about cleaning up after murdering Sherry Fay and his long cold shower. On cross-examination, Swirling asked him if he thought Bell had acted in an unusual manner during the questioning, and Walker replied, yes, and I will emphasize the word act. A psychiatrist and clinical social worker from Columbia who had evaluated Bell in 1975 and 1976 testified to his mental issues. Another psychologist who had seen Bell in the 70s also explained to the jury that when he had recently examined Bell, he showed what he called cognitive slippage, but then he admitted that that was basically professional jargon, not a real diagnosis. Swirling did get him to say he believed Bell had been mentally ill when he first examined him in 1976, but Myers asked him if he was out of touch with reality or insane now, and the doctor answered definitively, no not in any sense of the word. And now it was time for Larry Jean Bell to testify on his own behalf, and he started off with the crazy act right away, insisting on standing in the witness box because, quote, there are no chairs at the gates to hell. 
He talked about his life growing up and then would sneak in a tangent like this one, quote, No matter what the doctors say, I am mentally ill. I have never done a vicious, mean, dangerous crime. It's important to cooperate with doctors because they can save a person from the electric chair and get a person guilty but a mentally ill verdict. Food for thought. He would often add these silly non sequiturs like that food for thought to the end of sentences. His favorite to shout out, ironically, was silence is golden. But that statement was not only ridiculous in basically trying to tell the jury he was mentally ill, it was also a lie. Larry Jean Bell had a long record of assaulting and harassing women. He was a liar and a bad actor. He was on the stand for six hours, often rambling about visions from God and one of Sherry Fay that he said, quote, I shall not explain because the family is present, and that is creeping over into their personal life and to me here. They have been through enough, and silence is golden. Swirling took him through his record of assaults on women and girls, always pointing out that they were blonde-haired. Bell generally agreed with anything he had already been convicted of, while remaining cagey about the specifics of Sherry Fay's murder. It's easy to see that Jack Swirling was trying to illustrate his client's sick obsession with blonde girls, hoping to add to the mental defect defense. But Bell himself was a bit too cunning. It was obvious he answered the questions he wanted to and deflected the questions for which he was on trial for. After another psychologist testified for the defense claiming Bell was possibly schizophrenic and at times psychotic, Swirling requested and got another competency hearing, again interrupting the trial. Bell was harassing Swirling's co-counsel, a blonde woman named Elizabeth Levy. He kept sticking his finger in her ear and calling her Elizabeth Smith. That would be Don Smith's middle name. When another psychologist was testifying for the competency portion, Dr. Diane Fallingstad, Bell shouted out off the record, You're beautiful. I love blondes in a professional sense. At this, Judge Smith had enough. He remarked that Bell had a flair for the theatrical, but was obviously choosing which questions he wanted to answer. He once again ruled him competent. As the trial resumed, Next up was the venerable FBI agent, John Douglas. Douglas characterized Bell as rational, lucid, and articulate. He also testified that he instructed investigators on how to get Bell to confess with the statement that the bad side of Larry Jean Bell may have done this crime. John Douglas explained that this is called a face-saving scenario. By questioning about his good and bad side, he gave him the chance to provide an excuse for his crimes by blaming his bad side. It was bait, and Larry Jean Bell had pounced on it. After Douglas's testimony, Swirling rested, and both sides gave impassioned closing arguments. Bell kept interrupting his own lawyer, causing Judge Smith to warn him yet again. He told him they could remove him from the courtroom if he kept it up, and Bell stood up and said, Legally, in the eyes of God, I have already been here for over seven months, so in my hand, no price I bring, simply to the cross I cling. At this, Swirling asked for a recess because his client wasn't making sense, and then Larry Jean Bell suddenly stood up and said, I would like to ask Dawn Elizabeth Smith to marry me. Judge Smith immediately said, Mr. Bell is simply serving his own purposes in his efforts to be theatrical, and this court isn't going to tolerate it. Then Jack Swirling asked for a mistrial because of the prejudice that his client's actions in court might have on the case. The judge refused. So Bell was brought back into the courtroom, and as he walked in, he swerved towards Dawn and the Smith family. Mr. Smith immediately stood up as officers grabbed Bell and guided him into his seat. The judge explained to the jury the two counts of kidnapping and murder and an added charge of involuntary manslaughter if they didn't feel it was murder. And then he explained the different verdicts they could render. Not guilty, guilty, or guilty but mentally ill, or not guilty by reason of insanity. I know this is confusing, but the distinctions between guilty but mentally ill or not guilty by reason of insanity lie in the sentencing portion. Not guilty by reason of insanity takes the death penalty off the table. And a guilty but mentally ill verdict would open up more mitigating circumstances in sentencing. But it didn't matter. The jury didn't believe his act any more than the judge did. After 11 days of testimony, they deliberated only 55 minutes before returning a verdict of guilty for count one of kidnapping and guilty on count two of murder. 
During the sentencing portion of the case, three women testified against Larry Jean Bell. They were the three different women he had been convicted of assaulting and harassing. Solicitor Myers also brought up the last call to Dawn Smith, showing his continuing pattern, where Bell had made clear threats to her. Dawn testified again, saying, He told me that I was going to be next, that God had chosen me to join my sister, and that I couldn't be protected all the time. And as she stepped down from the witness stand, Larry Jean Bell smiled and waved to her. When it was time to testify on his own behalf to try and save his life, he spent his time harassing Dawn while on the stand. He said, Look into my eyes, special angel. It is guaranteed if you will accept my hand in holy matrimony. Will you marry me, my singing angel? Remember, Dawn was an accomplished singer who had planned a career in Christian music with her sister, Sherry Faye Smith. Larry Jean Bell knew everything about her. It was chilling. When his defense attorney asked him, Are you insane? Bell answered, No, I'm not insane, but well, I might be, and I might not be. Swirling asked again for another competency exam or a mistrial due to his client's antics. Judge John Hamilton Smith refused both. The jury was out of the room for this argument and then brought back in as Swirling continued the arduous task of questioning his client. When asked direct questions, Bell simply answered, I am not responsible for that. When Swirling finished his questions, Bell asked if he could say one more thing, and Solicitor Myers objected. The judge said he would allow it, so Myers changed tactics and said then he wasn't through with his cross-examination. Finally, in agreement, Myers said, Go on, Mr. Bell. Bell said, Food for thought. The only thing I am guilty of, from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet, is lusting for Miss Dawn Elizabeth Smith, and I would like to take her hand in holy matrimony. This brought on more back and forth until Swirling again requested a competency hearing. Sighing, the judge agreed. But again, after Bell was examined, he quickly declared him competent. After this, Larry Jean Bell's family testified in a last-ditch effort to save his life. They said he had always been, quote, a peculiar child. But they didn't have much else to offer in excuse for his horrendous crimes. Larry Jean had not been abused or suffered anything that would explain his sexual and murderous fixation on blonde women and girls. After this testimony, the judge called it for the day. But before he did, he explained to Larry Jean Bell that on the following day, he would have one more chance to speak for himself. Bell said, Do I get the last word? The judge sighed and said, Yes, sir. To which Bell said, Fine, I will think about it. Judge John Hamilton Smith shook his head and said, All right, fine. You can think about that overnight. At the gates of hell, of course. I burst out laughing when I read this. Throughout the court proceedings, it is evident the judge was impatient with Bell's antics, but he never spoke with his sarcasm in front of the jury. And that is also true for the prosecutor and defense attorney. Though technically rivals, they often joked and showed great camaraderie when the jury was out of the room. They both knew Larry Jean Bell was guilty as hell. It was now a matter of whether or not he would be put to death. When this case was over, they would still live and work in the same area. They would be here long after Bell was gone. Both men made passionate closing arguments at the sentencing phase. Solicitor Myers in particular made a dramatic moment by picking up the same pen that Sherry Faye Smith had written that letter with, the same pen they had found in Larry Jean Bell's room in his parents' home and had Sherry's fingerprint on it. Myers laid the pen on the rail of the jury box and reminded the jurors that Sherry Faye Smith had written with that pen that some good will come of this. He said those were her last words, and now I pass this pen to you. Sign your name to the right sentence. Let us never again hear that horrible bell ringing of sadism, no conscience, no remorse, no sorrow. Let your verdict bring a sweet sound to Sherry Smith. Using that pen was a powerful move, and the bell metaphor wasn't lost on me and probably not on the jury either. They deliberated for two hours and 15 minutes before sentencing Larry Jean Bell to death. The trial for the abduction and murder of Deborah May Helmick began 13 months later on March 23, 1987. This trial had been moved to Pickens County, 120 miles away in upcountry area. 
It was presided over by Judge Lawrence Richter, though Myers and Swirling were back for the prosecution and defense. One major difference in the Helmick trial is that the forensic pathologist was fairly sure of the cause of death. Due to the decomposition around Deborah May's face and neck being more advanced than the rest of her body, and due to the hair clumps found around her body with tape residue, the jury learned that little Deborah May Helmick had been suffocated with duct tape wrapped around her head. According to one of Larry Jean Bell's calls to Dawn, this was the exact same way that Sherry Faye Smith had died. I am not going to go into the same detail I did with Bell's first trial for one simple reason. The same Larry Jean Bell didn't show up for the second trial. This Bell was subdued, only speaking in court to confirm his birth date and social security number. There were no more theatrics, no last-minute declarations of love for Don Smith or pleas of his own insanity. I'm sure that the court officers were relieved, but the media was curious. When asked by the press about Bell's change in demeanor, Jack Swirling, the consummate defense attorney, explained that he believed his client had a psychotic episode during the Smith trial, but that he was now composed and he hoped that he would stay that way. Swirling was still valiantly trying to save Bell's life. The Helmick jury only deliberated for an hour and 18 minutes before delivering two guilty verdicts for kidnapping and murder. Larry Jean Bell wasn't just quiet. He showed no emotion at all as the verdict was read. And that same jury deliberated for just one hour and seven minutes before handing down another death sentence. Though he would have years of appeals ahead of him, Larry Jean Bell now faced two death sentences, and he seemed resigned to his fate. But ten years on death row changed his mind. When Bell's defense attorneys asked for a competency hearing and a bid to stop his execution, they brought in mental health experts and prison social workers. They testified that Bell still stuck to his delusions, to the point of endangering his life with other prisoners. He smeared his feces on the wall of his cell because he said the water in his toilet was holy water. He told a psychiatrist that he didn't kill those girls. He said, I just hid them in God's secret place. But after three days of testimony, Judge David Mearing ruled that Bell met the state's sanity test and set his execution date for October 4, 1996, at 1 a.m. in Columbia, South Carolina. Larry Jean Bell remained silent through this proceeding as well. And Deborah May Helmick's family was there, including Becky, Deborah May's blonde little sister who was now 17 years old. Though Bell never met the eyes of Deborah May's mother or uttered a word throughout the hearing, he kept turning around and staring at Becky Helmick. Another beautiful blonde girl. Ten years on death row had done nothing to quell his obsession. Larry Jean Bell was electrocuted by the state of South Carolina and died at 1.12 a.m. on Friday, October 4, 1996. He had chosen electrocution. The state had switched to lethal injection in 1995, but any death row inmate sentenced before that date was given a choice. Larry Jean Bell really only ever had one adult skill that he used as a career. He was an electrician. Southern Fried True Crime is written and produced by me, Erica Kelly. The original graphic art is by Coley Horner, and Southern Fried's original music is by Rob Harrison of Gamma Radio. Again, special thanks to Arcadia Publishing and SLED Lieutenant Rita Schuler for allowing me to use her incredible book, Murder in the Midlands, Larry Jean Bell and the 28 Days of Terror that shook South Carolina. You can find the link in my show notes. I did not have the time I wanted to in this episode to go into all of the advocacy the Smith family has conducted over the years. The year after after her sister's murder, Dawn Smith won Miss South Carolina and came in second runner-up for the Miss America pageant. She continues to sing and to help others to this day. She wrote a book called Grace So Amazing, and her mother, Hilda Smith, wrote one called The Rose of Sherry. Both women and Mr. Smith have been staunch victim advocates, speaking all over the United States. And one thing I do want to emphasize again is their unwavering faith and the fact that the Smiths have always refused to engage in death penalty debates. The only one who has ever commented is Mr. Smith, and he would only say that the death penalty does not bring closure. 
The Helmicks remained very private after the trials and execution. Though they experienced some dark times, they also credit their devout faith in getting them through the greatest tragedy of their lives. I have immense respect for both families, and along with Miss Schuler's book and the Smiths, there are several documentaries and even a TV movie on the case. I will link to these in my show notes. And guess what, y'all? I'll be back at CrimeCon this year in New Orleans. I really hope some of you can make the trip. I would love to meet you, and I'm looking forward to seeing familiar faces from last year. It's June 7th through the 9th, and if you're interested in going, please use my promo code to purchase your ticket. It's Fried Crime 19. Several of your favorite podcasters will also be in the Big Easy, along with speakers, exhibits, workshops, and everything CrimeCon has to offer. So again, to buy a ticket, don't forget to use my code Fried Crime 19. If you enjoyed today's show, don't forget to subscribe subscribe and please tell a friend or rate and review on iTunes. I'm on most large platforms like Stitcher and other podcatchers. If you're interested in supporting the show, please visit my website, southernfriedtruecrime.com. There you can sign up to be a patron of the show or make a one-time donation or purchase show merchandise. That's southernfriedtruecrime.com. If you have any comments, corrections, or suggestions, you can email me at southernfriedtruecrime at gmail.com. I love hearing from you guys and I'm always looking for new cases, so please feel free to reach out. I am also all over social media. Just search the show name in your favorite platform. If you're interested in discussing this case or any other episodes further, come check out my discussion group. It is linked to my Southern Fried True Crime Facebook page. Until next time, thanks so much for listening. Y'all take care.